you guys didn't like my last two videos, you're probably not gonna like this. My God, it looks so good. I look so good. So excited. I'm so excited. <laughs> Yo, yo, Josh, yo. So a few months ago, I brought you guys my custom low light picture profile for the Sony a7 III, and the response has been tremendous. You guys have taken to the street and sent me all sorts of photos and videos. It's been amazing to be a part of that, so thank you guys so much for sending me that stuff, and I'm hoping that this episode inspires that kind of interaction even more. If you don't know what I'm talking about, picture profile, watch this video here and program those settings into your camera and then circle back because tonight's episode is gonna piggyback off of that lesson. Then once we're all on the same page, I can give you guys one of my my LUTs and turn your footage into some sci-fi Blade Runner looking thing. The inspiration was Blade Runner, but somehow in the creative process, it turned into Supertron. Sorry. Regarding the low light picture profile that I made, I have to answer a few questions that I get a lot. Number one, can this profile work for other Sony Alpha cameras? And number two, is this profile always better than S-Log2 at night? So I've personally owned about six Sony Alpha cameras over the last few years. And with this profile, I've experienced noticeable gains in low light performance with all of them. So yeah, more or less, it will work with the Sony Alpha line, as long as they have a custom picture profile option and still gamma. Now, in terms of S-Log2, I wanna add that there are some cases, some scenarios where S-Log2 is better than this profile. Things where you need dynamic range, like a music venue and you have bright stage lights and you're trying to expose for everything. So in that case, yeah. Anyway, that was a little bit of a tangent. I'm gonna do more low light tips like shooting S-Log2 at night and all these other things in a follow-up video in a few weeks. Not important. What is important? Blade Runner. So the question is, how do you take an ordinary cityscape with a wide array of colors and harmonize all those colors using hue shift and color theory to make an eye-popping color grade. So let's break this down. So in a city, you have a variety of colors. Most older cities are still gonna have the tungsten colored city street lights. Those are actually high pressure sodium bulbs. Those yellow orange bulbs that you remember growing up and they took a few minutes to warm up and turn on, they still have those today. Then we have LEDs, which are newer. They're replacing these sodium bulbs. The cost has come down significantly in recent years. These are popping up everywhere in cities now. Then we have mercury vapor bulbs. These are even less common, but these are normally on top of rooftops, around factories, industrial complexes, and these emit a green hue. These are also slowly being replaced by LEDs. Now LEDs, they appear white sometimes, but they're actually blue. Now, even though you'd think white is better, they become problematic when they start interacting with the objects in their environment. The most common example would be it being next to a tree and then now color casting everything green. Then we got office buildings here. These are generally fluorescent tubes. These are cooler in terms of Kelvins, but because of window tinting, sometimes these can appear to be light green, light orange, or light blue. And then you got, of course, colored lights. We have signage from these buildings, which can be anything. You have a lot of cars, so the front are gonna be white. The tail lights are gonna be red. You have an occasional stoplight or two. And then you have these little red aircraft warning lights on top of buildings. Needless to say, these colors are all over the place, but when you break it down, the most common ubiquitous colors are gonna be orange, blue, green, and red. So using a tool in Lightroom, we can actually change all those hues very easily. Let's go down to the HSL tab and open up full panel so you have hue, saturation, and luminance. This is where most of the work is gonna happen. This is basically telling us how the computer is going to interpret those colors. So we can take red and we can slide it towards magenta, or we can take orange and slide it towards red, or we can take, uh, let's take yellow, slide it more towards orange, take greens, then we'll go the opposite way here. We'll start jamming everything. Then we got saturation here, so we can actually mute some of these colors that we don't want. So let's get rid of the greens. We'll punch up the aquas. And then we also have luminance. And luminance tells us how bright we want each color to be. So if you want colors to fade away, you bring the luminance up, you give it more light. If you want them to deepen and to be more concentrated, then you bring the luminance down. Looks interesting, it's not there yet. The second tool, which is the game changer here, is actually split toning. Split toning, you can force colors into highlights and into shadows. 
All right, so highlights. Let's do the highlights are going to be magenta. And then we, ooh, wow, that's really intense. We can just scale that down. There we go. And then let's do the opposite. So then if we want to push it even further, we can go down to calibration here. Um, this will let us force even more colors. Um, it's actually just telling our camera, it's telling the computer to interpret certain colors as other colors right from the get-go. You get the idea. What we're doing is we're actually forcing these hues into other hues and we can start combining them. So it starts harmonizing the image. What gets really technical is when you start bringing in color theory and you start balancing out the image. Complementary colors or triad colors, analogous colors. The idea is to slowly nudge these colors into a more favorable direction, one that aligns with whatever color palette we're working with without pushing them so far as to break apart the image. In photos, especially if you're shooting with a high res 12 bit or 14 bit raw file, it's actually not that hard to do. You can push the colors around quite a bit before they start really breaking apart and showing artifacts. In fact, there's already a few YouTubers who've beat me to it. Denny from Denny's Tips, bro, my hat is off to you. This is a hardcore plug right now. His video definitely needs more views. Watch his video if you guys wanna know more on this Lightroom workflow, it, he absolutely nails it. Okay, so now what about with video. Photos and photo-based workflows like time lapses, hyperlapses, and burst lapse, you're going to have more flexibility pushing these colors around. With video using compression, you need a very large codec like ProRes 4444 in order to pull this off without shredding the image apart to a saturated mess. With an 8-bit XAVC codec, it's going to be a real negotiation on how far we can push these colors before the entire image just breaks apart. But we're not alone. Otis, what are you doing tonight? Systems Online, creating a new project in DaVinci Resolve. Analyzing color profiles of the Blade Runner fields. You guys ready to go? First lookup table created. 1982. Film in the franchise, 2049, has a more vibrant palette. Research on Blade Runner shows it's not an original source. Yeah, the Philip Dick novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? We should probably analyze that as well. I've already begun. Third lookup table created, Electric Sheep. The book and the film really shaped a lot of the cyberpunk genre that we know today. There is one other book that had a huge role. William Gibson released Neuromancer two years after Blade Runner. That book had a huge impact on what we know as a cyberpunk genre in general. Third lookup table created, Cybermancer. Warning, the color grade at 100% intensity is too strong. We are at the limits of the XAVC codec, severe color banding present. Switching to 6K burst lapse mode. God, that grade is terrible on skin tones. As expected, these grades are not meant for skin. Though try decadent and teal. Reduce opacity to taste. You see what's fascinating about the whole cyberpunk genre in general is just how it's evolved over time. It's Blade Runner took structural notes from the anti-hero detective novels of like the 50s, but the world building, the actual aesthetics of it, that was taken from French comic books of the 1970s. And it can be traced back to one dude, a legendary graphic artist in the comic world. This guy was master of masters. Otis, compile our last grade on the works of Jean Giraud. I just came up with an idea. Analyzing the works of graphic artist Sean Giro, known by pen name, Mobius, the film Blade Runner, used his illustrations as visual reference. 
you are manually modifying the node tree. This will take some time to process. In the meantime, your air transport has arrived. Modifications complete. Uploading finalized color grade. This is Mobius. Using modified light rays, we can push the color grades past 100% and inject an additional color into the grade. And now I'm that YouTuber that rides in choppers. I have Jump Shark here. All right, so the important stuff. The light ray effect, so awesome, so easy to do. And I think it added an extra layer to our footage, more of that cyberpunk genre, which is a society under heavy surveillance. So awesome, full episode on it right here. So that's not up yet, circle back. Towards the end where Otis was pushing us into color grades that were really just starting to break apart the image, it was very clear that the 6K burst lapse footage held up significantly better than the standard XAVC 8-bit codec from the Sony a7 III. The funny thing is that I wasn't even shooting RAW, I was shooting JPEGs, which are technically compressed, so you're already getting a lossy format, but I think because they're layered in each frame, there's much more clarity and color definition in those frames. And for all my burst laps haters out there, bro, the evidence presents itself. Let's get to the LUTs. Keep in mind, I'm just a super creative. I reverse engineer things. I break them down, I rebuild them up. I am not a colorist. I don't use a color calibrated monitor. And I'm sure any colorist can pick this video apart and rightfully so. The truth is slapping on one of these demanding color grades onto any piece of footage and expecting fabulous results is grossly misleading. In fact, when you're doing a color grade like this on a bunch of pieces of footage, you often have to spend a little bit of time working with each clip, massaging it into that direction so that the grade works. In order for these grades to work properly, you're gonna wanna color transform and color correct your footage first and then add the LUT on. Will these LUTs work in the daytime? Save you and me the embarrassment they will not work, don't even try. Ideally, you're gonna put the LUT on, you're gonna adjust the white balance, you'll scale up the intensity until you have a desired result. Getting a good denoiser is a good investment. Instead of adding the denoiser on first, add it on at the very end, and it should help get rid of that color artifact. Will these LUTs work with other footage? 1DX, C300 Mark II, Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Will it work with drone footage? I don't know, let's find out. Pull up some stock footage, see if we can get a drone clip. Works on super illegal drone footage. Yeah, that guy definitely broke a law. If you guys wanna know more in depth of how I work with these LUTs and denoising and the workflow, I'm gonna do a follow-up video, yada, yada, yada. Stay tuned for that. And now for the hardcore plug. I don't sell anything unless I really think it's badass. And these LUTs are so much fun. Go to my website. Link is in the description down below, five pack. The first one is that cool desaturated and yellow 1982 look. Vehicles, underpasses, buildings with lots of reflections. It looks killer when you plug it in with light ray effect. It's like 2049, this is that super magenta and teal look and add on to like nighttime footage and slowly scale it up in intensity and start bringing out some colors that weren't there at all. Cybermancer is so badass. I wanted to name it Neuromancer, but then I was worried I might get sued. So Cybermancer, but really it's Neuromancer. I'm not gonna lie, this one's the most difficult to pull off because the grade is so extreme. 80s Miami Vice feel, which is like, Oh my God, it's my favorite. I gave you two Decker and Teals. The first Decker and Teal was meant for buildings and it's super vibrant, nuclear orange. It looks amazing with buildings that are blasting out a ton of light. This one is much more skin friendly. I brought those colors down. I opened up the palette to yellows and reds and normal tones that are in skin. 
I love it how whenever they have these LUTs and they give one away, they always give away the shitty one. Go to my website, hit the subscribe button, boom, get yourself a free one. And I'm gonna give you guys another one over to my Instagram. I left a secret code embedded in one of the last three posts. If you find it, you go back to my website, enter that code, you get yourself another one. It's not gonna be easy to find, so please don't ruin the surprise for others. If you do find it and you do get it, please post your work. I wanna see it, I wanna see the creative stuff you guys are doing. Anyway, this is Joshua saying thank you very much, stay creative, go make some Blade Runner art.